Do you and I live in a culture that is never satisfied? It seems as though there's this incessant desire always for more. And when I mean more, I mean a greater quantity. I mean bigger, a bigger number or a larger amount in addition to whatever it is that we have. It can be more money, more clothes, more toys, more square feet, or more followers. In reality, the pursuit of more, I think you would probably agree with me, is, is really uh, in, a, in a very real way, defining and describing the culture that we live in. More power, more wealth, more prestige, more reputation, more sex, more authority, more. We're looking for more always. We're driven for more. But there's a problem with this lifestyle choice of desiring more. When we constantly desire more, if we're honest, we're never truly satisfied. Because there can always be more. Wouldn't you agree? No matter what your more is, there can always be more. And by definition, the desire for more is ultimately unquenchable. Because there's always more. No matter how much money you have in your bank account, there is more. More earned, more saved, more invested. No matter how big your house is, there's always more. Bigger, newer, nicer. No matter how many likes you have on your Instagram post or views on your TikTok videos, there can always be more. When more is the goal, friends, there's no way for us to ever arrive. Someone once said that a heart and a mind that is consumed by and obsessing over what others have is like a cup with a perpetual leak that can never be filled. This is the problem. The problem with always wanting more brings us to a place where we're, we're not experiencing happiness and contentment the way that God would intend for us to. This is not the abundant life that he wants you and I to live. And there's lots of reasons for it. This is such a big deal to God that he included one of the reasons for this in the big 10, the 10 commandments. As a matter of fact, the last, the 10th of the 10 says this in Exodus chapter 20, or 20, verse 17. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And if you're like me, you look at that verse and you're like, well, I'm not doing too bad. I don't think I've ever, I've ever coveted an ox or a donkey before, <laughs> right? Uh, this is a commandment that actually has to do with what's going on inside. It has to do with what's going, inside, uh, going on inside your heart and what's going on inside your mind. This is a commandment that really stands apart from all the rest of the commandments because uh, this is one of the ones that others wouldn't even necessarily know is going on in our lives. Covet means to strongly desire. It ultimately means to lust after something, not just physically, but to want something so bad that you can't stop thinking about it. So lust is not just a sexual thing. So we can lust after things that someone else has. And when we do that, this likely will lead to us damaging our own heart and mind. It's going to hurt our relationships with other people. And it will also be destructive to our relationship with God. Now we know that this is a problem and clearly it's been a problem for a long time. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, in 1965, there was a song that came to this musician in the middle of the night, and he woke up and recorded a few of the riffs and a few of the lyrics on a cassette tape. And some of you are like, what's that, Doug? <clears throat> right, just ask your parents. <clears throat> Three weeks later, that song was recorded and became the number one hit in both the UK and the United States. And today, let's see if by playing a few bars, you can't recognize this song. <clears throat> Anybody remember that song? Yeah, yeah. What, what's the name of that song? Yeah, yeah. Rolling Stone magazine once wrote that it was number two on the list of the top 500 greatest songs of all time. The lyrics say, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction because I try and I try and I try and I try. I can't get no. 
So Mick Jagger, who also wrote some of the lyrics to this song, said that this really came out of an expression of what he was seeing in his frustration with consumerism and commercialism that he found in our world. And so what's so good is that here we sit 59 years later doing oh so much better. To this end, God drops the mic on the top 10 list with the final commandment, you must not covet. This is next level. God is saying it's not just what you do, but I also care deeply about your heart. And I care about your motives. And I care about the way you think. And the problem with coveting begins when you become so dissatisfied with what you have that you begin to compare yourself with other people and you become jealous of what they have. And eventually this progresses to being obsessed with what others have and I think we all know that this is a disease. This is a disease that affects not only our finances but also our marriages, our children, our other relationships, our work and nearly every other area of our lives including our relationship with the Lord. So let's just be honest. This never-ending passion for more is toxic to our souls. Let me say that again. This never-ending passion for more is toxic to our souls. And social media is really helping us with this. No, not at all. Uh, It's made it worse. And it's made it way too easy for us to compare with others and to feel bad about what we have. So this coveting is one of the most sneaky and deceptive sins that we can commit. So over the last couple of weeks, as I've been doing some reading about this topic that I knew we were going to be teaching about, I came across a quote from Francis Xavier, who was a Roman Catholic priest and missionary from the 1500s. And towards the end of his uh, time on, on, on earth, he was quoted to having said this, As an older man, I have listened to thousands of confessions, and I have yet to hear one person confess to the sin of covetousness. It is what I call the stealth sin. I was thinking about that this week, and I don't think it's just a stealth sin, but it's also a double-edged matter of the heart, because coveting and envy go right together. And let me try and explain what I mean by that. The unique evil of covetousness is what we value, is when we, well, when we value what our neighbor has more than we value our neighbor. And we begin to envy them in what they have. And, and, and coveting is wanting what the other person has. Envy is being angry towards them because of what they have. Do you see how evil this thing can go? And the enemy knows how to work this one in our minds. And to all of this, Jesus, when he was here, gives this stern warning. Uh, He said this in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, beware. Someone say beware. Beware. I think if Jesus says beware, we should Beware. beware. Beware, guard against every kind of greed, he said. Life is not measured by how much you own. Someone once said that covetousness is a poison that corrodes the soul, preventing us from experiencing the true joys and abundance that life has to offer. But So here's the deal. It seems odd to me that we know these things in some way, and yet as we look at the world around us, you see, if it was common to see examples of how this pursuit for more actually brought people to a place where they were like, there it is. Now I'm happy I have enough. Then we might look at this differently. If there was this this magical place that would lead us to being contempt, then we would all strive to get to that magical place. But that's not the way it works, is it? It's not even close to what we see. Quite the opposite is true. Most everyone who acquires more only continues to pursue more yet. And we see it in the lives of individuals, even individuals who have amassed a great, a great fortune and yet are never satisfied. Perhaps you've heard the quote from John D. Rockefeller, who in the early 1900s was the richest man in the world. 
And during an interview, he was asked, how much money is enough? And he famously said, just a little more. Just a little more. The richest man in the world not satisfied. More, friends, can never satisfy. So here's where we need to land today. How are we going to combat this toxin in our life? Because it's part of the culture we live in, and we all have margins of this in our, in our hearts and in our minds. And what's the antidote for this toxin? I want to show you something the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 11. Paul was writing, and he said this, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And, and we read what Paul said then, we're like, that kind of sounds like a fairy tale, Paul. Is that really possible? This is a completely different way of living compared to what most of us know and experience. So before we go any further, let's be clear on what contentment is. It's not pretending that things are going right for you when they really aren't. That's not contentment. That's just not reality. It's not pretending that you're feeling well when actually you're sick or in pain. Contentment is not always being treated nicely by others or always being in the exact place that you would aspire to be. Contentment is not having your surroundings exactly like you want them. Contentment is not the absence of a heavy heart or even some tears occasionally. Please hear me, this is important, that contentment is also not complacency. Because complacency refers to choosing to be satisfied with the current circumstance when we know there's need for improvement. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> when we think about complacency, it's an unwillingness to continue to learn and to continue to develop. So let's go back and look a little closer at what Paul said because I think it's, this truth is embedded right in this first verse from Philippians chapter 4. He says this in verse 11 again, Now, not that I was ever in need. If you know his story, he was in need a lot. But look what he says here. Don't forget this. For I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. So what jumps off the page to me, and I hope is also jumping off the page to you, is this. There's learning required here if we're going to live this way. It's not just going to happen vicariously. It's not just going to happen naturally. Even for those that have made the all-important decision to step across the line of faith, it's not like all of a sudden we got this one right. There is a learning that needs to be done. Paul said, I have learned how to be content. And by the way, at the time that he wrote those words, he was actually penning those words while sitting in prison. He had been imprisoned for, for preaching the gospel in a hostile and dangerous environment. And Paul had learned then, clearly he'd learned how to be content. Because I'm not content if I'm sitting in jail. But he had learned something that we need to learn as well. So this is a big week for the Miller family. Uh, this past Thursday marked since six years since the day that our oldest son, Josh, almost died. For those of you that don't know the story, Josh uh, was 23 years old and he had a sinus infection that went into his brain and he had multiple strokes and as a result of that, it took out the right side of his body and his ability to talk. He was in the hospital for 147 days that year and lived 111 days without a skull on the left side of his head. To say that this was brutal is a massive understatement. But what I can tell you is that I am uh, thrilled he's here today. Where are you, buddy? I know you're here. There he is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I told you this on Thursday. I'm glad you're alive. 
So just a few weeks ago, all of our kids were home as we were <clears throat> celebrating New Year's together, and uh, it was almost warm enough to go play pickleball, so we went to go play pickleball. <clears throat> That's the first time we've ever done that as a family, and so all of our kids were home, and, and there's significant others as well, uh, which if you know the Millers, uh, things are going to get pretty competitive fast, and for whatever reason, my, my, uh, my kids seem to marry people that are more competitive than us. <laughs> <clears throat> and date those that are competitive that way too. So we were playing pickleball, and I remember watching Josh with his knee brace on because he still has a limp on his right leg that was a direct result of all the damage to his brain from the strokes and the way that his brain communicates with his body. And I was watching Josh um, fighting through this, and uh, I, I had a moment where I was frustrated with God. <clears throat> because I remember Josh running <clears throat> better than most people know how to run and absolutely crushing people on a football field. I remember watching him. Uh, he was fourth in state and scoring in lacrosse his junior and senior year. And I remember those things. And to watch Josh with this limp frustrates a dad. And I'm thinking, you know, God, if you're gonna heal him, why don't you just take this thing all the way? And uh, that was frustrating to me. And I know what you're thinking, Doug, jeez, my gosh. We're talking about contentment today. <laughs> you seem to not have this very well figured out. And you're right. So what exactly is contentment? It's not so much a feeling as it is a knowing. It's different. So often our feelings drive our lives and that's not what they're meant to do. It's a knowing that's based on faith in who God is and what God has said. Contentment is on the inside. I like to say just knowing in your knower. Contentment is a deep down sense of well-being that's independent of our outward circumstances and based on a right relationship with Jesus. It's knowing that he is with you regardless of what we have to face. It's standing on his promises, like his promise that we've read before in Romans chapter eight, verse 28, that says all things work together for the good. Now let me stop for a second and tell you, you will never convince Josh or I or any of our family or you either that that was good. It was not good, it was horrible. But God made it good. Contentment is knowing that his grace is sufficient to see us through even the most hurtful and disappointing times of our lives. And so now, with this understanding of what contentment isn't and what contentment is, let's go back and reread Paul's words as he's sitting in prison. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. So as I've thought about these words of Paul and challenges all throughout scripture, as it relates to this incessant passion for more that is so part of our culture and also part of your life and mine, we have two options here. The first option is that we can continue to pursue this elusive more, believing that somehow there's a better life waiting if we were to acquire more, more money, more property, more fame, more whatever. Or we can reject the false notion that more is needed to discover happiness and we can work hard to learn what Paul has learned and find contentment in our circumstances and have gratitude for our blessings. The real question is, how? How do we learn to live this way? Because it goes against the grain of so much that we have become familiar with. So what I wanna share with you are a couple of biblical antidotes to um, to counteract this toxin of always wanting more. And what do I mean by antidote? 
If you know uh, biology and science and medical terminology at all, antidote is the agent that negates the effects of a toxin. So these are things that will block this propensity of ours to want more. Antidotes will mediate the effect by preventing absorption, in this context, absorption into our hearts and minds and souls. They will neutralize or inhibit the toxin's danger. So if you're ready to take some notes, here we go. Antidote number one. Remember, your worth is not tied to your net worth. Thank you, thank you is very quiet in here. <laughs> the average American house has tripled in square footage during the last 50 years, and it continues to grow larger every year. The average American woman owns four times the amount of clothes that her grandmother owned, but continues to buy more. And I would say it's not just American women, because I do this too. <laughs> The average American home has 300,000 items inside of it. And yet Amazon delivers another, another box almost every single day. <clears throat> you see, when more is the goal, we'll never find contentment. More is a moving target that can never be satisfied. Someone is always going to have more. So ultimately, this pursuit of more is unattainable. So I want you to listen again to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Friends, beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Why? Because we must always remember, friends, life is not measured by how much you own. It's not. I'm not defined by what I have. Rather, I am defined by by whose I am. Antidote number two. Stop comparing myself to others. All right, let me say that a little more. Look at me. If you have a tendency to compare yourself to others, this is deeply spiritual. Stop it. <laughs> Don't do it. Teddy Roosevelt famously said, comparison is the thief of joy. Social media, again, makes this brutally difficult. And by the way, have you not been so freaked out by these algorithms that are listening to what you talk about? How is it possible that they are feeding the very things you are in pursuit of by bringing them in front of you the second you open your Facebook and you're like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? How did they know I was looking for whatever it is that you were looking for? So I would encourage you that it might be high time for all of us to take a social media fast. And some of you might already be doing that. As a matter of fact, there's a large group uh, of women from the gathering that are doing, have decided together to do a social media fast, and they're doing that right now. No matter how great we're doing, we can always find someone else who's doing better or who has more. And it's even not even, it's nonsensical for us to compare ourselves to other people on social media because they're lying anyway. <laughs> and so their life's journey is different than your life's journey. And they might be in the middle or the end of their pursuit of whatever. And you're at the beginning and you feel like you're not measuring up. And again, they're still lying. Even on their happiest days, they're not as happy as they're presenting themselves to be. So stop comparing yourself to everyone else. Don't use others as a measuring stick for success. I want you to listen to the same Paul that wrote these words in 2 Corinthians when people were judging his motives for the ministry that he, was, that he was leading and planting churches and challenging people to live the Jesus way. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, he wrote these words. And he's getting a little snarky here. I kind of like it. He says, oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful, do you hear it, as these other men who tell you how important they are. Do you hear, like, it's snarky. He continues. But they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant, he says. What should be our standard? What is it that he's called you to? Measure yourself by yourself and your obedience to God and your passion for living the life that he has called us to live. Antidote number three. Remember, gratitude 
brings contentment. Being grateful helps us shift our focus from what we lack to what we have. And it won't erase the deficiency. Rather, instead, it helps us to look at the positives and to strive to appreciate the blessings that are already there. So why is gratitude so important? Because joy is grounded in gratitude. If we don't appreciate what we have, we're never going to enjoy what we have. <clears throat> when Josh was in the hospital at Craig, uh, we made a commitment to stay there uh, till the very end of the day, right before he would go to bed and before we left every single day. We were on mission to find something that we could be grateful for. What was the win for the day? Taught me a lot of lessons about how to pull through the day. So uh, this week as I was thinking about um, these, the things that I was gonna be sharing in the story about Josh, I, I decided I was gonna talk to Josh about what I was feeling. We don't talk about these things you know, that often anymore. But I was talking to Josh about how I was feeling uh, as his father you know, reflecting on his ability to move in days gone by compared to today and uh, how that was tough for me to watch him uh, not be able to move as proficiency, proficiently as he used to and frustrated that when God healed him, he didn't take it all the way to the finish line and heal him 100% so that he could run like he used to. And this is what Josh said to me. Dad, I think about it every day. But I've decided to be grateful that I'm alive and to be grateful <clears throat> that I can even go out there and try and play pickleball. And by the way, <clears throat> um, after I thought about this a few more minutes while we were out there, I was glad he was limping because that gave me a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I would never bet against Josh for a guy whose body has been beat up as badly as his was. Um, <clears throat> he'll, out, he'll still out hustle everybody I know. That's just Josh. But here's what I was thinking. The lesson learned for me is this. There's always gonna be some deficiency somewhere in our life. And if we think about it in terms of percentages, right? Like, I don't know what the percentage would be for Josh. Let's say his right leg works at 84%. Are we gonna spend our lives worrying about the percentage of def deficiency or are we gonna be grateful for what he does have? And see, this, this translates into every area of your life. You think about your, your income and you're like, gosh, I wish my income was X amount more and so there's this percentage of deficiency and you're not grateful for what you already have. You think about your job and you're like, hey, listen, 15% of my job really stinks. And we forget that our job is called work because it's work. It's not all gonna be fun and games and there's somebody else that very passionately would love to have your job. See, we, we look at these deficiencies and you think about your relationships. You think about your marriage and you focus in tenaciously on 15% of this relationship that isn't what I want and you ignore all of the things that are great and that's why gratitude is so important. The same guy Paul wrote these words about being content. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Author and teacher Brene Brown wrote it this way. In 12 years of research, I have never interviewed a single person with the ability to really experience joy who does not also actively practice gratitude. So friends, if this is you and you struggle in this area, I have another idea for you. Start a gratitude journal. You find, it might be hard at first, but you find some things because there's way more than you possibly even imagine for you to be thankful for than to be frustrated about. Antidote number four. This goes back to what I said when we were beginning. Living irrationally generous combats my desire for more. If you struggle always wanting more, this will solve it. Give it away. Give it away and watch what happens when you do. Watch how your heart comes alive when you do. It's been too long since I've encouraged you to do this, so I'll do it again. I love to have a $100 bill in my pocket that is not mine. God and I have made a decision that that's for whomever he taps me on the shoulder and, and says give it to. 
What does that do? It helps me to be on alert to and paying attention to ways that I can be generous. You need to do this. For many people, life has become this purposeless plotting of a proverbial treadmill, never finding any real meaning in life. When we were talking about this in our content meeting this week, Pastor Tommy was talking about the year where they had sat down with their budget and looked at this portion that they had that was discretional income. And he had started thinking about how stuff had started taking over in his life. So he made a commitment during this year to very intentionally do the very best that he could with the discretional income that was his to give to others. To be a blessing, and this is what he said, the more generous I was with what I have, the less owned I was by what I have. Someone needed to hear that today. Listen to what the proverb writer said in Proverbs eleven twenty five: 25. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So your worth is not tied to your net worth. Stop comparing myself to others. Gratitude will bring and breed contentment in my life. Living irrationally generous will combat my desire for more. And our fifth antidote, remember, first thing first. And we're gonna be talking about this some more. But in Matthew chapter six, Jesus says this, so don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear, These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Verse 33, we should memorize this. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Friends, if you want to seek more of anything, seek more of Jesus. Seek more of the kingdom of God and seek more righteousness. Got some areas in your life where you could pursue righteousness more? Me too. Paul wrote these words. Would you bow your head as I read them over you? In 1 Timothy 6, 6. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Father, I come before you with my friends today. Uh, This has been a week of me just living a little ahead of the week that that we're gonna be living together now as I've reflected on the, the lack of contentment that oftentimes I have in my life and how I've bought into this cultural lie that there will be this happiness once we achieve a certain place of more. And it's gonna rot my soul, it'll rot all of our souls, and it's gonna impact all areas of my life and my relationships and ultimately my relationship with you. And so today, Father, we pause together as your church and we ask for your help with this. This is a battle because our culture is communicating something completely different than this. And and, uh, Lord, there's a reason why they do. When we buy this lie, Lord, we're making decisions that, that aren't healthy and helpful. And our eyes are off of you. And will you just help us today to land on this reality that if we're gonna pursue more of anything, let it be more of you. And that we would learn to be grateful that we would stop comparing ourselves to others, that we would stop obsessing over a percentage that we wish looked different. Instead, Lord, we would would live grateful and generous and caring for those around us and do all we can to keep you as the first thing, that we would prioritize that above all else. Lord, I pray for someone here today that believes that their self-worth is somehow reflected by what they have and what they own. And Lord, I ask today that we would fall back into the incredible arms of our Heavenly Father that says those things will never define you, but a relationship with me will. And if you can hear my voice today and you've never stepped across the line of faith as we work to combat this incessant desire for more, that's where it starts. 
with a relationship with God. And whether you're here today and, and your relationship with him has been suffering in your pursuit of more or you're here today and you would say, I've never said yes to Jesus before, would you just simply pray with me, God, I need a recalibration of my life. I've bought the lie that this world has been handing, and I know the enemy's worked me over on this one. And so though today I ask you to forgive me because I've fallen short of your standard, and I'm praying today that I would lean hard onto the, the grace-filled, redemptive heart of our Heavenly Father that's giving me a chance today for a fresh start. I thank you for what you did on the cross, and today I ask that you would help me to have a tenacious focus on putting the first thing first. That Lord, you would help each of us to pursue you with our top priority of life. Lord, will you help each of us to remember this week that our desire for more needs to be eradicated and this comparison to others needs to be stopped. Will you help us, Lord, to be on high alert to ways that we can be a blessing to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray together, amen.